Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. I'll, I'll provide a, a brief introduction of our second guest uh, for tonight, uh, Professor David Flint. Uh, you've had a distinguished uh, legal academic career. You've been a media regulator and, and commentator, currently write for The Spectator and The Epoch Times, and you are the convener of the Australians for Constitutional Monarchy, where you ran and won the, the no case in, in 1999 referendum. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for that uh, very nice introduction. And you're also a author of several books, and the one we're going to focus on tonight, this was published in, I should know, because I I worked for the publisher, Connor Court, at the time, Give Us Back Our, our Country. It was uh, 20, 2013, was it? 2013, and I think there was a second edition in 2015. Yes. Uh, now... It's appropriately uh, timelessly titled Give Us Back Our Country, and I've titled tonight's show uh, Take Back Our Country, because that's that's what we've got to do in post-coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic world. We've got to, well, first get our freedom back, and second of all, make sure we're never in this uh, situation again. I, I mentioned uh, that uh, you're writer for the, the Epoch Times, which is a... a Chinese Communist Party dissident uh, uh, public publication, and uh, we've seen China. Uh, well, they they've been threatening us. Now they're they're, they're following through, uh, stopping exports uh, exports from Australia of barley and banning some of our our, our abattoirs. And well, it's. It seems now is the moment of truth. Are we are we going to cave and be bullied, or are we going to uh, stand up and maybe uh, 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 bear the, the brunt of, of a tough time to, to build a, a more self sufficient Australia? Well, Tim, uh, I, I think we should be very strong in this regard. We made a serious error, a number of serious errors, as did much of the West over the last twenty years, and our great error was in relation to admitting foreign investment and treating corporations from the mainland as if they were Belgian or Dutch or British corporations, little different from any other foreign investor and treating them on the same terms. They are very different. They are under, are under the control and direction of the Chinese Communist Party, which is an alien force which in no way respects the rule of law and which uh, plans to make China the dominant power in the world. We're very fortunate, we Australians, since the settlement. The dominant power in the world has always been a benign power, very similar to us, a similar system of law, speaking the same language, having the same values. It was the very first part of our life as a a number of settled colonies and then a federal commonwealth. The dominant power in the world was Great Britain. That power has gradually moved to the United States of America, a very similar power, probably the most benign great power the world's ever seen. And if anybody doubts that, and there's a lot of anti-American propaganda, I think anybody who doubts that should look at the situation at the end of the Second World War. What other power in defeating Germany and in defeating Japan did not make any territorial claims, but instead acted in the most benign and benevolent way in giving great amounts of aid to those countries, which allowed them to restore themselves, making, I think, a great mistake in giving that aid. It should, of course, I think, be lent on the basis that it would be repaid when those powers were in a position to repay the money. But both Germany and Japan have had this great benefit. And during most of the post Second World War period, they've also been defended against hostile powers. In, in the first instance, the Soviet Union and then China, they've been defended 
by the United States of America. So they've got a very good bargain from a most benign power. Now, we're fortunate that we have this. What some people in Australia, some people who've uh, they've become like Lenin's useful idiots, they've accepted uh, that China is a power like any other, which it isn't. And there are others which, who have uh, gained significant advantages from the relationship with China in terms of money and influence there. But they have argued that we should gradually be surrendering our relationship with the United States to China. And they've admitted vast amounts of so-called foreign investment into Australia, which is not foreign investment, which has very dangerous implications and which has no advantage to us. We have, for example, the famous example of paddock to plate, where vast part, parts of our very best, our premium quality land, for example, in relation to dairy, has been handed over to companies which are really agents of the Chinese Communist Party. We saw that recently during the early part of the this crisis over the Wuhan virus, in which, for example, a real estate, Chinese real estate company in Sydney and other companies were instructed from Beijing to corner the market in masks and all sorts of medical equipment and get that equipment quickly to China, where it could be monopolized and sold outside at uh, great advantage to those who had imported it. What we did in relation to paddock to plate has been an absolute disaster. And that has been permitted by federal governments of both sides. And that has involved those parts of Australia being worked for the benefit of a Chinese company with the product being exported from Australia without even our gaining taxation from it because it is a product within the same company. We have been treated very foolishly and it's our politicians who have done that. And uh, what, what we should be doing, I, I think in many ways we've mishandled the, the crisis, but that's another issue. But what we should be doing, and I think the government is right there, is looking to find out what exactly happened. And I would take it one step further than the government has said, and that is we should expect reparations. We have been seriously damaged by actions of the Chinese communist government in suppressing the truth about the virus, in not warning the WHO, which they've turned into a puppet organization, in not warning the WHO early enough, so much so that it has been calculated by the University of Southampton that we've probably, we could have probably saved about 95% of the deaths had the WHO and the world been advised early of a pandemic of which the government of China was fully aware. They suppressed the truth as to whether it would be transmissible between humans. They delayed, delayed the truth in relation to that, but worse, far worse, the worst thing they did, whether the virus escaped from a, a laboratory, whether they are engaged in weaponizing viruses, we don't even know that, and we probably will not know, certainly not before it's used. But what they did was that they sealed off Wuhan and the province in which it's located. They stopped travel within China, but they allowed, perhaps even encouraged, because it was the only place to go, they allowed vast amounts of travel from Wuhan to the rest of the world, thus transmitting the virus and knowingly transmitting the virus to a number of Western countries. Now, that was an appalling act. It was worse than negligent because it was done knowingly. It was deceitful. And for that, we should be paid reparations, damages. Uh, I've looked at the way in which I, I read a piece for the Epoch Times on this. I think it's a mistake to think that this can be achieved through the World Health Organization or the United Nations because of the effective control, which 
the communist government will have over that. It's foolish to expect them to observe and apply international law because they did not do that in relation to one of the few tribunals which had any authority over them. That was the one which related to the South China Sea. The Philippines brought an action before that tribunal. The Chinese government had agreed to the jurisdiction of that tribunal many years ago when it signed up to the law of the sea. They'd probably forgotten that they'd done that because communist governments rarely, hardly ever will accept international jurisdictions. But they had accepted the jurisdiction of the tribunal in The Hague when the tribunal handed down its decision that what China was doing in relation to the South China Sea was against international law and that they had breached the rights of the Philippines and no doubt those of other countries with interest in the Philippines and the international community with the right to freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. What did the communist government do? They just tore the tribunal judgment up. They disregarded it. They said it was wrong. They had no recourse to go to any other tribunal. They just dismissed it. So even if uh, there were some ruling by an international body saying that uh, China breached her international obligations in relation to the virus, China would not accept that jurisdiction. What I've proposed, and it's in that piece in the Epoch Times, what I've proposed is something based on the Nuremberg Tribunal. We should establish an international commission with some like powers outside of the United Nations. And that commission should uh, consist of eminent international judges who should, according to international law and the rules of evidence which apply in relation to international law, find out what happened, whether China breached her international legal obligations, of which I think there can be no doubt whatsoever. China is the culprit here. And that commission should be entitled under the treaty which joins these countries, it should be entitled to make an award of damages. Now, obviously, the communist government would not pay those damages and would ridicule the tribunal and, and would make life difficult for the countries involved. But there is an easy way to recoup those reparations, and that is the vast amount of investments here by entities which are under the control of the Chinese Communist government. We could take all of those properties, those valuable premium pieces of real estate across the country, uh, those strategic things like the, the lease over the port of Darwin, all of those could be taken and the Americans could do the same in relation to those assets within the United States under the ownership or control of the Beijing government. That is the way I think we should handle it. Now, Obviously, China would react badly. And people say, oh, we, we mustn't do that. We mustn't, we mustn't worry the Chinese. We mustn't provoke them. I'm reminded very much of what happens when you become indulgent. If you become indulgent in life, you eat too much, you drink too much, you enjoy too much of a good thing. And that's what Australia has been doing. Not so much the Australian people, but powerful interest in Australia. Your doctor tells you to go on a diet. Well, I think Australia in many ways will have to go on a diet because the Chinese will react badly. The when I say the Chinese, I mean the communist Chinese because the Chinese people don't want this government. And if people challenge me on that, I would refer them to two elections. The last presidential election in Taiwan, where the Kuomintang, the old Nationalist Party, was showing much more pro-Beijing sentiments. The people overwhelmingly voted for the, the party which wants a free and independent Taiwan. And the same in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, there were municipal elections on municipal issues, but nevertheless, the people of Hong Kong overwhelmingly rejected the candidates, the communist candidates, by an enormous percentage. It was a landslide. The Chinese people are also, they also, like people everywhere, want to be free. They want to live under the rule of law. 
and this is what they really want. And I, I think we have to stand up to the communists. We can't continue in the situation. They've, they've done a terrible thing around the world and they will have to pay for that. Oh, Tim. To our, uh, our government's uh, credit and also the Labour opposition, they haven't blinked uh, when China has made all these threats to the perfectly re reasonable call for an independent international inquiry into the origins of the coronavirus, which we still don't know. There, there continues to be speculation about whether it, it was released from that lab in Wuhan or is the, the wet market we just don't know because uh, the Chinese Communist Party is so secret. And we are dealing with, uh, we, we've seen the character of the Chinese Communist Party and uh, its president for life now, Xi Jinping. It's an incredibly uh, paranoid, insecure regime, which is why it, it lashes out at what we would see as legitimate human rights concerns and espionage. Well, I think that's very true. Uh, I think that the it, it is not going far enough to just have an inquiry as to what happened. I think there should also be power in an international body to award reparations. So I know that would be uh, waving the red flag at the ball as it were, but I still think that this is an important thing which should be done. We shouldn't be afraid of doing that. And uh, I suspect that the United States may well be very interested in that because they've suffered terribly, as most Western countries have, because of the mishandling of this. Whether it was done deliberately, we do not know. But we certainly know that in not telling us and in sealing off Wuhan, but allowing people to travel overseas, that part was deliberate in that they did, they knew that they would be creating a terrible crisis in other countries. And they knew that they should have been telling us the truth. And telling the truth is a very difficult thing for communist governments. Uh, I remember it was, would have been a couple of months ago, uh, former House Speaker Bronwyn Bishop uh, talk about how uh, China, that how they uh, they shut off Wuhan, but we're letting flights going uh, going out to other uh, to uh, the rest rest of the world, and that brought the world economy to its its knees. And she was uh, dismissed, I think, by Nicholas Rees as a conspiracy theorist. But she, uh, a month later, she said, "You you all rubbished uh, my my theory, but look at the world now." And the argument has always been against standing up to China is that they can ruin our economy and way of life. Well, how much worse can it get as it is now? Exactly. And I think it would be worse to become a satellite of the People's Republic of China. That would be the very worst thing. Uh, those immigrants who came to Australia from Eastern Europe, who came from satellite nations, knew how terrible it was living in those countries. And we certainly don't want a world in which the uh, Chinese communists, the Beijing communists, are the dominant power in the world. And that's something which we must resist. And I think to the great credit of the American president, he is the first president to stand up to China and to, for example, in relation to trade, and I'm sure in relation to the reparations which should be paid, I think he will stand up too in relation to that. Well, the, the greatest asset to China in, in Western nations is the amount of self-hatred uh, of the, uh, the left. And it, in, we, we've seen that on display in Australia where the, uh, the far left and, and the Greens, they've managed to convince the politicians to uh, continually uh, uh, shoot uh, our nation in the, in the foot when it comes to our, our farmlands, uh, water, agriculture, all our manufacturings uh, gone, gone offshore. And they also uh, have now uh, clicked on to the identity politics weapon that you're criticizing us because you're, you're, you're xenophobic. They know, and we saw that, you mentioned Trump, we saw that on display yesterday when, when Trump told that uh, journalist, uh, 
about the spread of the coronavirus asked China, and that was apparently racist because she happened to be an Asian American reporter, which that, that's just a perfect personification of, and uh, I think it was Tony Abbott when he was prime minister talked about, uh, he was talking about the ABC, but this broadly describes the Australia's left as a whole. They take every other side except the Australian national interest. Well, I, I think you're very true, and we've always had this problem, and you have it more in a democracy than in a dictatorship because it's not tolerated in a, in a dictatorship. But we've had similar groups. We had them in the Second World War. Hal Kolbach in The Secret War writes about the terrible things, the ways in which the Australian fighting forces were undermined on the waterfront, and to a ex certain extent in some of the, uh, by some of the other unions in Australia. And that, that, was a, that was a terrible and a treacherous act against the interests of Australia. What we're seeing now is a, a bigger movement, I would agree with you, and that is the dominance of uh, the left in pushing all sorts of arguments which are against the interests of Australia. And to an extent, I think the mainstream media also plays a role in this in tolerating all sorts of alien things which are against the interests of Australia. Uh, every Western country is experiencing this. It's part and parcel of modern life, but uh, it is for the rank and file, the people with common sense. And I think there's still a significant number of people, ordinary Australians who reject the undermining of Australia and who, and who don't wish to see Australia become a Chinese satellite. In the same way in the United States, the doctrine of the Obama government of uh, administration of uh, managing the decline of America was rejected by those who voted for the president. And there's a very large number of Americans who support strongly the mantra that President Trump offered, that is make America great again. And his idea that America would be restored to the great position to which she should have been entitled. Now, uh, the West has been very foolish in relation to China and America, probably one of the most foolish because so much of her wealth has been purloined. So much of her intellectual property has been either taken or forced out of American corporations who <coughs> decided to invest in uh, the People's Republic. And that has meant that uh, America has effectively uh, funded uh, the the wealth, the growth of the Chinese economy. We've, to an extent, done a similar thing. Our politicians have allowed the, encouraged, I think, in many respects, the deindustrialization of Australia and uh, the sending away of our industries overseas, quite often to communist China. And I don't think that's been in the interest of the Australian people. Let's uh, turn to your, oh, we'll, we'll call it, uh, also call it a, a manifesto, uh, Give Us Back Our, Our Country, which was co-written with uh, Jai Martikovic, who you've also worked with, with Australians for Constitutional Monarchy. Uh, the pair of you headed up, it, it, it was one of the, the, the first efforts to, to counter uh, get up's influence can do. Uh, since then, we've seen uh, right on emerge and also uh, advance uh, Australia, and this I remember was during the the Gillard years when our freedoms were really uh, under under attack. Well, when we first felt that sort of the the paradigm was 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 changing, the book split up into two two parts: the the problems and the the principles. The overall message I got from the book is that politicians need there needs to be more methods to hold them to account directly from the people, not just once every three or four years. Like for example, in my home state of Victoria, we've only just today been released from house arrest, though none of us voted <laughs> for this uh, uh, house arrest uh, in the, the 2018 state election. Yet Daniel Andrews just says, speaks to us like children that this is what I think is good for you. You're going to cop it whether, I, whether you like it or not. What uh, what that book is based on, and uh, Australians take back your country is based on, which 
will be a movement is based on the fact that representative democracy has declined in Australia. We were formed on the basis of this being a representative democracy and very much on the Burkean principle that when you elect your representative, you, you uh, vest them with the authority to take decisions which they believe to be the right decisions. But since then, the political parties have developed to such an extent that uh, politicians no longer have minds of their own. They are instructed on how to vote. We have the appalling situation, for example, in the House of Representatives at question time that the questions are written out on either side and that the speaker has lost the autonomy that he or she has at Westminster where the speaker actually chooses the people. The speaker is told who to call. It's all a, it's all a theatre, a fourth-rate theatre, but an appalling theatre and uh, it is a parody of a representative democracy. The political parties have uh, so arranged things that most pre-selections or many pre-selections are no longer done by the members of the party. The members of the party have lost most of their powers. These have been taken over by power brokers within the parties who actually control the parties. The result has been that uh, we have one of the worst systems of government in the Western world, particularly, for example, in relation to our federation, which is now the most centralised fiscally, far more than any other federation, so, so much so that Canberra collects about 80% of the taxes, hands back about half of that to the states, but instructs them on how to spend it, taking away the whole point of federation, which is that each state get its own income and be answerable to its electors in relation to the spending of that income, in relation to the powers that it has constitutionally. I often, when I'm speaking, ask people, I put a proposition to them, and I say to them, it seems to me, and I think it's unchallengeable, that not one of the significant problems in Australia, or all of the significant problems in Australia, have either been created by the politicians or have been made significantly worse by them. And I ask people to name some significant problem which wasn't either created by the politicians or made significantly worse by them. And I find that most people are unable to name a problem. I would say even, even in relation to the virus, they've completely mismanaged that. And uh, if they'd followed world best practice, which was long ago set up by Taiwan, we would not have had a lockdown, for example, and we would have controlled entry in the first two months very strictly with, without being as lax as we were in those first two months, which are allowed much of the virus in, which created uh, those deaths. The country with the world's best practice, incidentally, is Taiwan. We have about 15 times the deaths of Taiwan, although we have similar populations. But going back to the politicians, in every significant area, the politicians have either created the problem or made it worse. Water, for example. We haven't had the whole idea of harvesting water, which is absolutely essential to make this country the great power that it was always intended to be, has been abandoned, was abandoned under the Hawke government. Hawke intervened in purely state matters in Tasmania and stopped, stopped the building of dams and the coalition has gone along with that. There's a, a dam to be built in New South Wales, but for many years we haven't seen dams and we should be seeing so many. And uh, in relation to electricity. We used to have the cheapest electricity in the world. Our electricity is now among the dearest in the world because of this decision by the politicians, although most of them don't believe in it by their behaviour, this obsession with global warming. And I don't think many of them actually believe in it because they wouldn't have such enormous carbon dioxide footprints. And uh, in education, we pour more and more money into education, but the standards keep falling and falling, so much so that in one notorious respect, our standards are lower than that of Kazakhstan's, the former People's Republic, and certainly lower in important respects than most of the countries to the north in Asia. 
and you, you just go over so many problems. Immigration, for example. We have extraordinarily high rates of immigration because we don't have the development we should be having. The immigrants naturally go into the three eastern capitals and just crowd those eastern capitals. There's no manufacturing work for the people. And that system is only being maintained because it helps increase the GDP, not the GDP per capita, it increases the gross GDP. So the politicians and the Reserve Bank can say, look, we haven't had a recession for a record number of years, which is a completely artificial situation. So many, so many of the problems of today have been created or exacerbated by the politicians. And we say there's an answer to this. The federation of this country was, it was going along, but it could never be achieved because when the constitutional, when the constitution was drafted by a convention, an appointed convention, went to the, what were then the colonial parliaments, the state parliaments, they all bickered among themselves. It would never have happened. It only happened because at Corowa, it was proposed at a people's conference that in future, the convention be directly elected and that rather than sending back the draft to the state parliaments, the colonial parliaments, after consultation, it should be the, put to the people by way of referendums in each of the six colonies. That was adopted, that plan was eventually adopted in 1896 and within less than four years we federated. We only federated because the people did it. The people directly elected the convention and the people approved the constitution. That's how we federated in less than four years, less than the time it takes to lay a tram track down George Street in Sydney. Now, that, that was the way to do it. We haven't reviewed that federation. We haven't reviewed our constitution in 120 years. And since then, we've had terrible things have happened. The, the politicians and the judges have rewritten the constitution without the permission of the people. I remember during the, const during the referendum, the Republican referendum, some people asked me, well, what if we win the first, what if we win the referendum and the Republicans come back with a second referendum? So I did some research and found that whenever the same question was put, for a second time, and some were put up to five times, the same subject area, not, not exactly the same question. It was always rejected by the people. So I, I, I calmed down constitutional monarchists on that point. But what I found was that all of those issues where the people had rejected handing over powers to the Commonwealth would no longer be necessary. And why would they no longer be necessary? Because the High Court had reinterpreted the Constitution, just as they've done in the United States. They've effectively changed the Constitution by interpretation. And I think we desperately need to look at our Constitution, to go back to the principles of federation. And the principles of federation were that the states have certain powers, the Commonwealth have others, the states have independent sources of income. All that's been changed without the people ever agreeing to it. That's an important thing. But the second thing is we have to do something about the political parties. The political parties have cornered an enormous amount of wealth from the from governments through the grant of monies per vote and so on. They've got all sorts of exemptions from laws, the privacy laws and the electoral laws. And uh, they've got certain advantages like the names of the parties on ballot papers and so on. What, we're, what we've argued that is that this, in return, in return for this cornucopia of legal privilege and exemptions and money, the parties should undertake and, and actually achieve to be what is normal in other countries, be open, transparent and democratic. Just look at the last election in the United States. Just see how, just remember how President Trump got the nomination. It was done through a series of primaries in different states where supporters, not members of the party, supporters of the Republicans voted in different states 
and that's how he merges with the candidate. Similar thing happened with the Democrats, except that uh, there was a bit of fraud going on there, and uh, that was a that was arranged. But the principle is there, and it's the same in Canada, and the same in Britain. It's the members of the parties or the supporters of the party who run the parties, not a group of power brokers who are getting rich because of their influence in the party, who put into into Parliament people who they ensure are pre-selected. It's, it's, so, so much is confected. And I think we also, we also should have more control over our politicians and we should import from Switzerland the concept of direct democracy. That is, that the people should have a say. The, the Premier of South Australia at the time of the Federation, whose name escapes me, had a proposal which he took to a constitutional convention to introduce direct democracy into the Australian constitution. And what he, what he was going to propose was that the people could by petition, and that there'd have to be a certain number, by petition, they could reject laws adopted by the parliament, something which happens in Switzerland. He was talked out of that by Alfred Deacon, who said, well, the principles of responsible government, that is that the government is rises and falls in the lower house and the members of the lower house vote freely on that because they don't vote freely anymore. They vote as they are directed by their parties and woe betide them. In, in Labour, you get expelled if you don't follow what are the party instructions. And effectively, the same thing happens with the Liberals, although they, they don't put that in writing. In most cases, you're in a lot of trouble if you if you deviate from what is the party line in the Liberal Party. So that that's another important principle that uh, the parties be reformed, that the people be entitled to control their politicians by a right of recall. That is by petition, they could ask for a new election in their electorate, which happens in a number of uh, overseas countries, happens in a number of American states and in one Canadian province and also the rule of the people by referendum. The people should be entitled by referendum to make all sorts of changes and to impose new laws, to decide whether treaties should be ratified. All of these things should be handed over to the people. Not many would come up, probably, in Australia. You never know. But uh, in the ultimate analysis, even the High Court admits the sovereign in Australia are the people of Australia. The sovereign power was with the people. And the preamble to the Constitution Act effectively says that because it says, whereas the people of the several states, humbly relying on the blessings of Almighty God, have agreed to unite in an insoluble federal commonwealth under the Crown and under the Constitution. It's all there in the Constitution, an agreement. It all depends on the people. And the people eventually should rule and we should make sure that the people rule because they would do a far better job than the politicians have done who've created the terrible mess that we're living in today of a declining Australia. Tim. Oh, you mentioned the uh, the High Court, which uh, we, we've seen the, the rise over the past oh, 50 plus years of uh, judicial activism, which culminated in Australia with that... Uh, decision that if uh, if a person had was de deemed to have Aboriginal ancestry, even if they weren't an Australian citizen, they could never be uh, alien, which I don't know where they got that in the constitution from. And probably overseas, the worst example was the uh, su oh, Supreme Court of the, the United Kingdom uh, decided that the, the Queen didn't have the power to prologue Parliament, which quite perplexed me, but then we've also got the, the public service, the bureaucrats as well, who they make a lot of their decisions. And there's, of course, that famous 80s British satire, Yes Minister, Sir Humphrey Appleby. He's always like, we can outlive these, these ministers. We run the country. We feed them what to do in the name of the people. I, I agree. And I think it's so important that the people have a greater say. Every three months in Switzerland, there are referendums. People would say, well, the politicians would say, oh, it's far too many, you couldn't possibly handle that. They handled it well in Switzerland, and these are referendums at the federal, 
state and uh, local government level. And the, these are important. And what we've got in Australia is this enormous centralization. There's a centralization in Canberra. Then there's a centralization, particularly in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. Uh, and those states, New South Wales and particularly Queensland, should not be as large as they are. We should have more states because there's, a, there's no uh, commonality between North Queensland, for, for example, and Brisbane. And the interests of North Queensland are different from those of Brisbane. In fact, the wealth of Queensland comes from North Queensland and is spent in Brisbane. And as with, with the massive amount of immigration that the federal government encourages, you get increasing numbers of seats in the cities. So more and more power goes to the cities and the politicians act in the interests of the cities, but the wealth comes from outside of the cities in the country. And we, we see this in the current uh, virus. I don't agree with the lockdown at all. But there, if we were to have a lockdown, it should be very different across the country. And there's no reason why in vast parts of the country where there's no virus at all, why they should be closing everything down, why their cafes and restaurants and small businesses should be closed. And there's, there's no point in that. And then you get these premiers pontificating, and the Premier of New South Wales saying, oh, we won't, do, we won't open these places today. We won't do it before Mother's Day, but we'll do it the following week. Mm. As if that would, what, what, what possible difference is that? Uh, and, and it is absolutely ridiculous. And it seems to me to be outrageous. When there is a real crisis, and this, this is a crisis, but it is a crisis which is manageable. We know from American research that many more people have been infected with the virus and that the death rate is probably closer to that of influenza. And there was no need to go overboard with the lockdown because they didn't do it in Taiwan. And Taiwan, with a similar population, has had six deaths and Australia has what, I suppose, about 100 now. 98 is the exact 98. figure right now. Yes. So uh, it's... We, we, we vest too much power on these people and once they get the power, they become power crazy and then there are elements of the left who see that and want to use that for other purposes. There was a letter, as you know, to Le Monde recently by a number of celebrities, uh, Robert De Niro and Madonna and Jane Fonda and our own Kate Blanchett, all protesting about the horrors of... Uh, global warming, which they say is created by CO2, the CO2 emissions, because they would have vast footprints, much larger than anybody like watching Kate Blanchett, this. she's yes. Uh, yes. constantly well, private, commuting yes. between Australia and the US. Yes, well, you have a private jet and you have three or four mansions across the country and vast numbers of servants in those mansions, your CO2 footprint, your contribution to global warming, if carbon dioxide is causing global warming, you're really the culprit. But they, they want, they saw what was done in relation to these uh, excessive lockdowns, I think. And, and they, they've, uh, they've argued that uh, these should be permanent, that mm. there should be no return to normal, that we should be closing down everything, except, of course, their private jets and their mansions everywhere and their vast limousines and so on. And they're eating in wonderful palatial restaurants, but uh, they believe that everybody else, it's, it's like Professor Lockdown, the Professor Neil Ferguson, the, the famous uh, computer modeler mm. who predicted all these vast numbers, I think uh, 2.2 million deaths in America. And I think his, his uh, thesis, the way in which he calculated deaths from the virus, probably produced the 150,000, which was predicted in Australia. Well, he, he, he is typical of the elites in that he follows the principle of uh, uh, do as I say, not as I do. Do as I say, not as I do. And uh, while he was telling everybody, instructing everybody to stay at home and only have these very minimal outside relationships, was having arranging secret assignations with his mistress. And for that, he's had to obviously resign. But... Uh, it just demonstrates and a number of uh, leading ministers and public officials in Australia have been found out in a similar way. They've told us what to do. They've, you know, they've got people with loud hailers. I, I saw this down at Bondi Beach. Uh, uh, a woman uh, uh, with a loud hailer 
closing off a path around the rocks. And then she saw, she saw a boy on a surfboard, well out. He couldn't be infecting anybody. It certainly wasn't in breach of the rules. He was well out on a surfboard. He'd probably got, got it to the sea, <coughs> excuse me, from the rocks. And uh, she was ordering him back to shore, which, for which she had no power. But she was so drunk with power, drunk with power like the premiers and the prime minister who, who were ordering everybody around, minutely ruling our lives, but destroying businesses. Mm. Many of those businesses in centres, in the shopping centres that you go around, many of them will never reopen again. The people who had jobs there will never get jobs again. They've, 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 it's been a wave of destruction and they haven't thought it out properly. And I just think that we really have to, we really have to assume much more power over the politicians because I, I think I have much greater faith and I'm sure you have much greater faith in the common sense of ordinary Australians uh, and the way in which they would run the country rather than this elite group of politicians who run it as if they were some aristocracy at Versailles. Uh, the expression is the the people won't uh, vote with their, their feet. And obviously the, the public could sense that the, the worst of the, the virus was, was over. And so even uh, in our state of Victoria, where we were all banned from seeing our mothers uh, for, for Mother's Day, uh, the shopping centres, they were uh, completely uh, packed and uh, the, the traffic on the road uh, was, was quite uh, heavy, but no, couldn't visit uh, mum. And as we saw on the steps of uh, Victoria's Parliament House, uh, you couldn't uh, ask questions of your government and hold them uh, to account. Well, I think you're absolutely right. And when we, when we consider what destruction has been wrought and the enormous debt which is being imposed on younger people like you. It, it is absolutely appalling. And for what point does this mean every time there's a pandemic and we have them every few years, does this mean that every time one is uh, 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 coming to Australia that we will have to, we'll have to close down the economy? And of course it means closing down the productive part of the economy the private sector, mm. while the public sector goes on enjoying all of its privileges, not sacrificing any of its privileges whatsoever, while while those in small business who, who are struggling away are the ones, and the ones who are employed by them, are the ones who suffer. Uh, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left, so let's move on to Oh, uh, probably your, your biggest uh, success uh, in activism, which was uh, uh, defeating the, uh, or uh, winning the, the, the no vote in the, the 1999 Republican referendum. Is it, um, is it unfair to say that maybe your greatest asset at the time was Malcolm Turnbull leading the Republican <laughs> movement? Well, it certainly was an asset uh, because... Uh, he, the way in which he ran it, but they, what they proposed, and, and, and like so many so-called Republicans, they were fake Republicans. They weren't real Republicans. The whole point of changing our constitution is that it should improve the governance of Australia. Just because they don't like the Queen or they don't like the royal family, that is not sufficient ground to change. And they, they couldn't even work out a reason for it. Eventually, they, the reason that they gave was that we had to have an Australian as head of state. But the, every government of Australia holds out the Governor General as the Australian head of state. And uh, in the 2016 election, although he campaigned on the basis that we needed a, an Australian as head of state, when Malcolm Turnbull was attacked for not being present for the reception of the remains of Australian soldiers which were brought back to Australia from Vietnam. His excuse, which he broadcast over Macquarie Radio, was that uh, well, there was no need for him to be present for that uh, reception because we had the Australian head of state there, the Governor General, the head of state. And that was that's the reason for changing the Constitution. What they put up, what they put up, for change was an appalling, faulty change, condemned at a 
at a meeting at the University of New South Wales by many eminent lawyers and all sorts of political experts and so on, some of whom to their great discredit then campaigned for it in the referendum. But what was generally reviled about it was that uh, it would have vastly increased the powers of the Prime Minister because the President, it would have been the only republic in the world in recorded history in which the Prime Minister would find it more easy to sack the President than his driver. <laughs> he could sack the President without grounds, without notice, and without any right of appeal. That would turn the President into a puppet of the Prime Minister. And that would mean that on those significant occasions when the Governor-General has to exercise supervisory powers, the Governor-General would be completely the puppet of the Prime Minister, which would be very bad. We say, and I think it's a long-held principle, that the Crown is important in the Constitution, not for the power it wields, but the power it denies others. That is, for, to do a number of things, the Prime Minister or the Ministers have to seek the approval of the Governor-General. And that's a way in which you have a check and balance in our constitutional monarchy. We had the choice, and it was carefully considered at the time of Federation of moving to an executive form of government, an executive presidency. And we adopted a lot from the American Constitution. We, of all countries in the world, are the child of both the United Kingdom and the United States. And we took a lot from the American Constitution. We made some mistakes there, but uh, we certainly took a lot from the American Constitution, but we decided to keep the idea of responsible government. That is what emerged in Britain uh, just before Queen Victoria, and that is the present constitutional monarchy. I call it constitutional monarchy Mark II, because it's different from the first constitutional monarchy from the glorious revolution of 1688. Constitutional monarchy Mark II has the, the crown exercising only a constitutional supervision in the constitution, but not e exercising political power, which was the case under the earlier form of the constitutional monarchy. And th that is a very good system. Of all the systems in the world which have been exported and lasted for a reasonable period of time, only the English system has done that. The American system, they've tried to export the American system and it's worked for a short while sometimes, but then it's ended up in dictatorship. Even when it was exported to France in 1848, under the the Second Republic, within a short period of time it had been converted into an authoritarian empire. It had changed. It's never worked anywhere in the world for long. The constitutional monarchy, as we've noted, as the British developed it, has worked well. It's even worked well, interestingly, in the Middle East, in Arab countries, in Muslim countries like Afghanistan, where it's worked superbly. It's only been brought down by the military following NASA and seizing power, but it's worked very well in uh, in the Middle East and, uh, and it still works in Jordan, for example. But it, it is a very elegant and sophisticated system of government. If we're going to keep the system of government, which was the idea from Turnbull and Keating was to keep our system of government, not to go to the American system of government of a, an executive presidency. We're going to keep that. The system we have works very well. There are other parts of the Constitution which do not work, work appallingly, which need to be corrected. The Crown, exercised by the, principally by the Governors General and the Governors, works very well. It's very efficient, doesn't cost us a lot of money. And it's something which is not the weak point of the constitutional system and should be kept. The, the attitude of the, the ordinary Australian, or as it's termed now, the, the, the term is the quiet Australian, if it ain't broke, 
don't fix it. And obviously the Republican push in the 90s was assisted by the the royal uh, divorces. And we've seen recently the uh, uh, royal, uh, royal family uh, embroiled in uh, quite uh, salacious uh, headlines with, uh, it's termed Megxit, uh, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's uh, departure from the royal family and obviously Prince Andrew's uh, relationship with uh, uh, Jeffrey Epstein, a uh, uh, convicted sex offender. Um, uh, but obviously the Queen Elizabeth II, she has been the model monarch throughout and she's always managed these crises. And, and everybody's sort of wondering when, uh, and, and everyone's saying long may she reign, but nobody lives forever. And Prince Charles, he is noted for his social activism on issues such as climate change, so is Prince William, which, and monarchies tend to only fall if they start to interfere in the operations of government. I'm not sure if you've ever seen the the, se uh, the, the second miniseries in the British House of Cards uh, trilogy when the, the new king uh, interferes in uh, uh, Francis Zirkert's government. Uh, what uh, uh, Obviously, you know the royal family more than, than any of us. Uh, when uh, Prince Charles becomes king and then William, do you think uh, that there could be these governance issues which uh, could arise which haven't haven't occurred uh, in in the in the British monarchy since obviously uh, uh, we, we go back to I think it was the glorious revolution the Republicans always have a silver bullet and the silver bullet is for many including Mr Turnbull is the the end of this reign at the end of this reign the, the Australian people, like the people of the world will be fascinated. There will be sadness and there'll be a retrospective and enormous retrospective. It'll be the major media retrospective of the life and times of Elizabeth and what a perfect monarch she was. And then there'll be fascination, great fascination over not only the new king, but the new king's family and the successor who will be the Prince of Wales. Yeah, but there'll also be there'll be remarkable interest in the, the only remaining coronation in which uh, the king is not only crowned but uh, set aside and that that will be that will be a that will be a, a matter of enormous interest the last thing Australians will be thinking of will be turning Australia into a, a republic I think that uh, Prince Charles will when he's king, I think he'll be a good king. I think he will uh, forget his flirtation with global warming. He'll probably still be a global warmist. He'll realize that the projections which he's believed in, like all computer projections, have been wrong and that the world has not ended or is not about to end, as has been projected. And uh, I, I don't think he will be in any way pushing that. I was looking at uh, that question of Prince Charles taking a position in relation to global warming and then I thought but on the other hand every prime minister of every realm, of the 16 of them, and every leader of the opposition of every realm is a supporter of global warming such as the way in which it is impacted in the in the electoral systems of the world. But I, I think he will steer away from that, which is his principal weakness. And I don't see him in behaving in any other way than as a constitutional monarch. Constitutional monarchs are not expected to be infallible, but they're expected not to talk about matters which in any way can be seen as political. And I think he will realize that in relation to global warming. I think he, his reign will be short, obviously, but uh, I, I don't think William will become involved in any matters political. I think he will be a good king. So we have a, a number of monarchs ahead of us. The monarchy since the Glorious Revolution, in fact, the, the monarchy 
uh, developed by the Glorious Revolution is, is, is essentially one which requires that the people accept the monarch, and if the monarch is not acceptable to the people, then the monarch should go. It, it, is, it has that fragile side. And that reflects the fact that the Australian constitution, I think the constitutional system right back, if you go back to, uh, to the time of the Glorious Revolution, I think it is accepted and Bolingbroke put it wonderfully when he described the constitution as that assembly of laws, institutions and customs by which the people have agreed to be governed. Constitution, constitutional system requires the agreement of the people. We have that specifically in our constitution, in the referendum. The others tend not to have that and leave it to parliament or special majorities and so on. So I think the, and the Queen made it very clear during the referendum, she took no part, she didn't campaign. She said it's a matter for the Australian people and I think that will be very clear. The incumbent will be, the incumbent must be accepted by the people. If the incumbent becomes unaccepted, then that, that incumbent has to go under the system of constitutional monarchy. And there are others in waiting who might be prepared to take the position. I, I think it, it, it works. It's a good system. It works. The, it, it means that we have the representatives, the viceroys, the governors general and governors that overall works well. There haven't been many who, who have been lemons who've had to go. And I, I think it's a very effective system and works better than uh, Westminster republics. The alternative, if we were to change, the alternative is to go to the American system and have an executive presidency. But again, again, it doesn't guarantee great leadership. No political system guarantees great leadership. As you know, Tim, great political le leaders are pretty rare. You don't often get a Margaret Thatcher. You don't often get a Winston Churchill or Ronald Reagan. These, are, these don't come along often and the system doesn't provide it, but it does. It should allow them to emerge easily. The American system has the great advantage, as we saw with President Trump, and not everybody will agree with me that he is a great president. But uh, the system does allow somebody to emerge from outside. It has that virtue. Whereas uh, ours, our system, not so much the British, because they have, they the party can elect the leader, but under our system, the the leader has to emerge through the parliament. In America, in Great Britain and Canada, the leader can emerge from the party, and that person then is put into parliament. The Canadians have had examples of that, and that that I think is the way our party should be going. But we have we have political parties which are the most backward. Well, in the Western at, world. Look at uh, the last decade in uh, Australian politics. Uh, no prime minister has been able to serve out a full term. They're removed by their their party, which uh, I think says a lot. Uh, let's finish off with, obviously, it was the biggest uh, uh, news, non-coronavirus news story yesterday, the retirement from radio of, of Alan Jones, uh, number one uh, broadcaster in Sydney for many years. I don't have the, the exact number of, of consecutive surveys uh, that, he, that he won, uh, but uh, it, was, it was a record. I know that uh, you and him have been friends for um, many years. You wrote a, a, a tribute uh, to his career in The, in the Spectator uh, yesterday, he he is seventy nine years old. He's uh, he's had uh, cancer. He's had uh, back surgery, and in the end, he did take the the doctor's advice that he did need to uh, uh, cut uh, cut back. And obviously, there were the usual uh, detractors who who celebrated. But he's still going to be on on Sky News twice a week with, the, and also he's a newspaper columns and and certainly a a reduced uh, capacity Alan Jones uh, for a few uh, uh, a few extra years is is, is certainly better uh, uh, better than if he if he just went um, all out uh, in in detriment to uh, his health but he has had a, a 
when we talk about influence, it's been influence uh, uh, for the for the better. It's it's not you, you don't get too many uh, media uh, commentators and journalists who can instruct fear uh, in in politicians that they're up against somebody who who's going to hold them to, uh, to account. No know, knows has done their homework, knows their knows their their facts and and figures, and doesn't matter whether you're a liberal or Labor if. Uh, if you were trying to duck and weave responsibility or weren't were neglecting something, he'd let you know and and he'd he'd get an answer from you. And he'd also champion a lot of a lot of small small business people, farmers, rural people. He was obviously had a affiliation to the Liberal Party, but he. He championed what he believed was was right, and he's had an extraordinary life, starting off as uh, just a well, uh, growing up on a farm, being a teacher, then becoming a rugby coach, and now a broadcaster. It's an extraordinary life. Yes, it, it is an amazing life. In in ancient Rome, they they used to be magistrates who were appointed specifically to look out for the interests of the people with special powers, the tribunes. And I call that piece in Spectator Alan Jones Tribune of the People, because in many ways he he was that. I was thinking about his influence and I thought today he probably, as just a, an individual, is more influential than all the commentators on the ABC collectively. He is really extraordinarily influential. I don't see that going. He is a remarkable person because and in that piece, I likened him to a Renaissance prince in the sense that he unites in his person and a strong interest in politics, the life of the the city-state, the, the Commonwealth. He has a, an extraordinary interest in the arts and in sports. He was probably the most successful coach of the Wallabies uh, in the history of that uh, team. He He has this very wide interest and of activities. He he is extraordinarily generous, both in relation to his time and his resources concerning charities and matters of people who are in need. And he really is an exceptional person. And I, I do regard him very highly as the tribune of the people. And I think he's uh, I, I think back, for example, to the, uh, the referendum. In the referendum, all of the mainstream media, commercial and public, like the ABC, and uh, uh, print and electronic, all of them were overwhelmingly next to unanimous, unanimously in favour of attacking the Crown some of them said they were real Republicans, were a bit confused about that, a couple of newspapers, but they were all opposed to the Crown. One person, one prominent person came up, and that was Alan Jones, which required enormous courage because you were ridiculed if you took that position, although we did win. We won nationally, we won every state, and we won 72% uh, of electorates, which if you translated that into electoral terms, would have been a landslide in the House of Representatives. And he was a significant force in relation to that. When people used to ring him up and they were undecided, he, he developed a line which became one of our wonderful slogans. And that was, if you don't know, vote no. If you don't know, vote no. And that was very effective. And he he's, He's run a number of campaigns. He's always running campaigns in favour of individuals or in favour of causes which are being overlooked by the politicians. And you're right, he strikes fear into the hearts of politicians. And I'm sure the bottles of champagne were opened yesterday when, uh, when he announced his departure from radio. I notice that it's very interesting. There's a restrictive requirement, the sort of thing that you have when, you, when you're a, a valuable asset. He can't go into radio again 
until uh, I think June of next year. And uh, does that mean that uh, he may emerge in an audio way? Again, I, I wouldn't put that, I wouldn't rule that out. He'll certainly be there on television. He has the column in the Telegraph, which is very influential. Does that clause cover podcasts? Uh, I think yes. that's what you're alluding that's to. That's an interesting point. I, I, was, I was thinking of asking that, whether, uh, have a look at the, uh, the exclusions because uh, it'll be interesting. I, I would not rule that out in the same way that John Law. He couldn't stay away. Yes, he had to go and he went to, uh, to 2SM, which used to be the Catholic station in Sydney. And that has a, but that has a very large rural network, which uh, they, they stay with John Law. So I, I think uh, in, in many ways, uh, Alan Jones is like Rush, Rush Limbo in the United States, who's I think he has, uh, the last time I looked, there was over 40 million mm. listeners. Now, audio is very strong. And that is, that is the field in which Alan Jones makes his strongest mark. And I think it may be difficult for, difficult for him to stay away from it. I can understand that the getting up at 2.30 and running the program for over three hours, what is it, five... 5.40 yeah. to 9. And replying to every correspondence yeah. uh, he gets, which is, yeah. that's incredible as well, to get a reply from, yes. from somebody su uh, su such as him. And he reads all the reports and, and, yes. and goes through the, the, the documents. It's incredible. Yes. I know that the, the American system from which we take ours is much more like the what you're doing. It involves... It involves one person running it for uh, three hours without many without many calls coming in. Although it's called talkback, the talkback part, at least the big ones like Rush Limbaugh seem to not involve much mm. talkback at all. Not as not as much advertising. We seem to have much more advertising than they do in the United States. And uh, as you say, with the development of technology podcast. I think it's only in the last couple of years that Alan has gone into Facebook, but the, the, the impact has been enormous with the, the, the viewing. The number of people looking at his posts is quite extraordinary and they do have an enormous impact and I should imagine that will continue. You, you may not remember, he used to have, he used to have a daily comment which went out on nine. Channel yes, nine. I do remember that. I am old enough to remember that. <laughs> and when when young Packer, James Packer, sold nine, as the, almost the day he sold it, the the people, the the no doubt the left wing or Channel Nine, the, the journals immediately got rid of that. Mm. Although the whole country, large numbers of people used to tell me, well, we come in from the we come in from the field to hear that because they didn't hear. Alan on radio because the national network didn't go that far in those days, but they used to come in to hear him on television where he'd, he'd give a comment, which has only went for three or four minutes, but it was very influential and I could see him doing that sort of thing again. So beware politicians, don't think, don't think, don't think you've been let off. And Alan would admit that sometimes in the heat of the moment, he he, he did, he, he has gone too far and he's uh, admitted that we won't go through those times here. But even the, the people who vowed they'd never go on his show uh, again or who he, uh, he, he was quite relentless in attacking, they still went back on his show. The, the Greens MPs, when they were talking about uh, coal, uh, coal seam gas, they were happy to go on Alan Jones's show uh, to talk about it. And Clover Moore, when uh, I think she was talking about one of her uh, recycling programs, even I won't repeat the comments, but even after all that, Clover Moore was still happy to, to, to go on. It was so true. And sometimes people would grab something and use it as a method to attack it, for example. There's a saying, put a sock in it, and that's that's a very common saying. He he put it he put it in unusual terms. Yeah. I don't think he meant to put it in the way that he did, mm. but they, that was seized on, and I'm sure yeah. that the New Zealand Prime Minister. Oh, New she Zealand she Prime wasn't. Minister, so she didn't really care in the end. It yes. was all the people on Twitter who decided to be, which is common these days, be offended 
uh, on her behalf. She uh, she just said, "Oh well, the All Blacks uh, beat uh, the Wallabies on the weekend. That's <laughs> yes. revenge enough for me." And she deserved to be reprimanded because she was telling us about our failure to observe mm. uh, the rules against global warming, whereas we were doing better. If that's mm. an important thing, mm. I don't think it is. If that's an important thing, then New Zealand was. Yeah. In any way, I, I think politicians are quite used to being abused. Just listen to Question Time <laughs> in Australia. Not, not, not so much in Britain, where it's more, more dignified. But uh, uh, some of the things he said were... Uh, I, I, there was one thing I remember. Uh, he, he used the... I, I won't use the phrase, but it, uh, it's like uh, something in a wood pile. I won't yes, use the phrase. Yes. It's mm. offensive, but uh, it, that was a phrase which was common when I was a boy. You, you heard it. Oh, well, when, uh, when he worked on the farm, <laughs> which uh, ob ob obviously, yeah, you don't, uh, it, it, it's not the darn thing uh, these days. Mm. Uh, yeah, um, we, we talked about how he instilled fear in politicians and certainly some of them will be celebrating, but uh, he did get that the Prime Minister and the Premier of New South Wales ring him up to, uh, or, uh, I guess, uh, uh, revere his uh, career. And I think a lot of those that he grilled over the years, uh, they, they, uh, they would concede they, they did make him better better politicians and i think i, I saw peter credlin last night on on sky uh, uh, talk about when she was tony abbott's chief of staff when they got something from helen it was it was treated very seriously and it's the same as uh, when he was a coach and a, and a teacher he 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 was tough uh, but uh, uh, that's how you you build uh, build skill and 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 character and I remember I, I spoke to somebody who uh, was his pupil at, uh, I think it was Brisbane Grammar, who said that he was a tough teacher, but you were never bored in his class and you you definitely did learn. <laughs> well, I can imagine that. He he is really a splendid person. And uh, I, I think, I, I can well understand why the, the, the rigidity and the discipline and the, the time was involved in that program has become too much. Uh, but uh, I, I think he will continue to be a, a force in Australia and uh, I think a force for good. He will make, we all make mistakes, mm. but uh, essentially a force for good. When you speak for what well, he did three and a half hours uh, every day, uh, every weekday, five days a week for most weeks of the year, and I do, well, this total stream has gone for uh, at present over over two hours. You're bound to say uh, something which is factually incorrect, or you didn't put it uh, eloquently uh, as that. That's that's part of being in the in the in the in the in the, in the public eye, but. Alan, overall, he, he, he has done tremendous uh, service to uh, Australia. We'll, we'll leave it there because we've gone way over time, but I've appreciated your time tonight, uh, Professor David Flint. Uh, ConnorCourtPublishing.com.au is uh, where you can uh, purchase uh, this book. I, I don't think uh, my plug can maybe sell... Uh, as many as uh, being on the Alan Jones show uh, did, but uh, uh, every, every, every bit helps. Uh, and can I, may I say, may I add that there is a, there is a petition about, uh, which summarizes the principles of that book. It's uh, in my name. There, I think there are two, if you, if you go ch to change.org and you Google it, you'll find two. I think one is to have me dismissed from something. <laughs> Uh, so ignore that one because it's no longer relevant anyway. It may not still be there, but the other is uh, this one, Australians take back your country. And it really sets out what we would try to do with a convention and what we would try to attain in the reform and review of the Constitution of Australia to make the politicians more accountable and empower the people. And uh, I'll provide a, a link to that uh, petition in the in the show notes uh, page. So once again, thank you for your time. 
uh all the best uh into the future it's been a it's been a pleasure to talk to you thank you very much Tim. it's been a pleasure for me and thank you for the opportunity to speak and the time that you allowed me to talk thank you thanks for tuning in to wilmsfront visit timwilms.com or rational rise tv to view the archive of episodes and keep visiting the unshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.